Hello and welcome to another edition of City Corner, an ongoing discussion program about what's going on in our community. My name is Trish Heron. I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager for the City of Richland. And joining us today is Joe Schissel. He's the Parks and Public Facilities Director for the City. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here. So you have a huge task ahead of you. You manage over 59 parks and public facilities for the city. Why are outdoor facilities or recreation locations important to our citizens? Our citizens have historically um, asked for, for this large number of recreational amenities. And dating back to the Hanford days, um, you know, when, when folks were off work or um, wanted to be away from the project site, uh, they wanted to have outdoor recreation places for, for their families. And based on our hot climate and um, citizens looking for shade and places along the waterfront, our park system has developed um, the way that it has today. So when you do master planning to determine where, um, so our core Richland is a little bit different because those parks over the years just developed the way that they developed. So we do have some of those smaller parks that the city does maintain for historical reasons. Those are our parks. But in the areas that we're planning out, how do you determine, you mentioned the different levels of parks. How do we determine what goes where? Yeah, so the city has um, a park trail and open space master plan. It's a um, five-year planning document. Uh, we just finished um, the current cycle last year, so it's pretty fresh. It's out there on the website for anyone to see. And um, essentially what that document says is for, for the city of Richland, there's a variety of park types. Mm -hmm. And we've located those park types throughout the city. So there's regional parks. So you might think of Howard Amon Park or Badger Mountain Community Park or Claybell Park as your regional parks. So those are parks that are destination parks. So there might be clusters of sports fields. Um, there might be um, swimming pools or splash amenities. Um, there are amenities that'll draw large crowds, essentially. And then there are smaller neighborhood parks that you typically can walk to. So the, um, the plan itself identifies, there's a good half dozen different types of parks, but generally there's these, these larger facilities that will attract the larger crowds, and then um, smaller parks that are close to your home that you can typically walk to, um, and everything in between. We also have a number of sort of special use um, types of parks that are designated kind of for one, one particular thing. Um, like so we might, mentioned before, like a dog park like a or dog park, yes. a skate park, those are specific, right? Great examples, yes. Okay. Um, and we also have parks that um, serve essentially as, as walking paths or transportation corridors too, so linear parks. So uh, the Keene Road Trail would be one of those. Um, the Shelter Belt Trail uh, would be another. So there, those are facilities that provide kind of a landscape buffer between sometimes two incompatible land uses, um, but typically often include a trail element. And the interesting piece about the trail element is it gives people an opportunity to potentially see a different part of Richland, like the Urban Greenbelt Trail. is shows people like the backside of Cadillac and it walks all the way through and it's a, it's a nice, nice path because it's easy for people to walk. I know that you guys have tours, but people don't take into consideration the maintenance of all of these different amenities you spoke of. We traditionally think of parks as something that you have to maintain, but you have to maintain all of these different types of amenities and resources and facilities for our citizens which comes out of the general budget. So what does that mean to a taxpayer that you know, is paying into the, the general budget that you, you then use to maintain all these facilities? Yeah, Oof, there's a lot to maintain. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, there's upwards of 150 different locations and then several different types of amenities and, and turf and shelters and that, that sort of thing in each location. So again, R Richland citizens value their parks, and I really just can't stress that enough. And um, we hear about it every day out in the field. We hear about it on, on the social media or in the office um, about you know, some, some issue that has come up in a park or a dream that someone has um, to do something different in a park. So we just we hear about it all the time. Um, so that having been said, and, and we all know that there's limited resources, 
we are just as careful and as tight with our budget as we can be. And um, we've, we've been moving forward with, with flat budgets for a number of years intentionally because we really wanted to find just how deep we could cut into, um, into budgets and staffing to find the minimum level of service that we can maintain in our parks and, and to meet the expectations that, that people want to see out in the parks. Last year, um, we pushed that really far and actually got some negative feedback that, hey, you all um, cut a little too deep and some of the parks didn't meet our expectation. And, um, and that was really, really excellent feedback to get because we wanted to find just, just how efficient we could become um, with the taxpayers' money and maintaining our parks. So this year we're stepping it up just a little bit um, with, with seasonal help. So we have our seasonal labor um, coming on board as the growing season is, is upon us. And it's time to start mowing lawns and pruning trees and edging the grass and all of that. Um, so they'll, they'll be starting soon. Um, citizens will be seeing um, staff out in the field uh, maintaining our parks um, at the level they expect. And uh, you know, it's, it's a very seasonal kind of activity. Right. Um, in, the, in the winter time and the off season, we're typically fixing facilities, you know, uh, different, different items that, that broke out in the field, we're typically fixing those. Um, during the growing season, we're usually dealing with, um, with turf and fertilizing and pesticide and, um, and, and trees and then making sure that all of our playgrounds and other facilities are safe. Um, and so in terms of meeting our citizens' expectations within that limited amount of resources, it's a real balancing act. Um, but I think last year was a, um, a good exercise for us to go through to, um, to find just that right mix. So finding that right mix works really well with the number that we're at, because you guys have found the balance, but we're continuing to grow. So how do you keep that balance knowing that you need to continue to grow, that we'll be adding more parks as, as we continue to grow? How do you find that balance as, as, as it's continuing to move? It's, it's a moving, you're on top of a ball trying to do all this balancing act. Yeah, it's always about money, right? Right, of yeah. course. So, um, as you know, if you were to look at the city's budget um, in terms of a, um, a pie graph, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the parks maintenance budget is, is a slice of pie within that graph. Right. Um, and, and that slice of pie lives within other slices of pie. You know, so we have the you know, emergency services budget and we've um, got to keep the lights on and this and that. So there's... <laughs> got to keep the lights <laughs> on. Got to keep the lights on. Go so there, Yeah. So there's, there's always a competition for resources um, amongst um, the city, city budget. And, and that competition is, is informed and kind of developed, um, of course, by, by city council from feedback from citizens. And so that slice of pie that's in that graph for parks maintenance is a certain size. Right. Um, but, the, but the pie itself can get bigger, and, and that happens when the city grows. And so the, the growth of the city and good, sound economic development is good for the park system. And so as we move into new areas in Badger Mountain South, as we get um, new industry in North Richland, and as we redevelop you know, the center of our city, that's good for everyone. And so if that slice of pie within the pie graph is at the right size, which I believe it is, mm -hmm. and that's what our citizens expect, um, you know, we don't lobby to make that, that slice of pie any bigger, we make the pie bigger. And so that's, that's why um, economic development is good for everyone. So you speak of economic development, um, and traditionally people think of economic development, all of the, the new um, development that's happening out at Queensgate. But you can also look at, we for years have always talked about tourism being economic development. And you guys are really doing a huge push on developing amenities that will bring in that outside resource, which and then it turns around and helps our economic development overall. So do you want to talk about some of the, some of the push that you guys are doing this year? I'm glad you asked that. Um, so over the last couple of years, 
we have spent extra resources to get the condition, to get the playing surface of our play fields up to a competitive level. So if you were to go out to Columbia Playfield today and, and look at the playing conditions on the um, fast pitch softball fields, they are as good as they have ever been. Um, the Horn Rapids Athletic Complex is another example, as is um, the Badger Mountain Fields off Keene Road. Um, the intent in making all of those improvements is to attract tournaments, and tournaments attract tourism. So many of our capital projects in the department are funded by lodging tax mm -hmm. dollars. So anytime um, an out-of-town visitor comes into our community and they stay in a hotel, there's a little piece of lodging tax that's applied to that room, room stay. And the city makes those grant dollars available competitively internally and externally to um, eligible projects that the state defines as eligible. So the Parks Department competes for those, is typically awarded um, those funds annually or a portion of those funds annually, and we use those usually for projects that create additional tourism. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a process that kind of feeds on itself. So the lodging tax dollars create tourism amenities. <clears throat> we use a little bit of extra resource dollars to maintain those facilities to create competitive level play, and both those things together work to attract um, tourists to our community and tournaments. But it's not just the facilities. I mean, the facilities are amazing, but you guys have really stepped up your game with recruiting. It's competition to try and get these larger you know, sporting activities to come into our community. Marketing is, is a huge piece of that. And as you know, out of your group, you've been helping us it wasn't a lot a with that. It was a self-plug. It was your staff has been really beating the streets and trying to bring in you know, to benefit all of us. And we've ha had a very small portion of it, but it's been primarily your staff that's been doing it. So. Yeah, and we've, it's been a great partnership. We're a good team working mm -hmm. together on that. And so just last weekend, um, there was a tournament in town. Um, the bulk of the tournament was actually happening um, in Pasco at the track facility. Um, but that facility couldn't handle all of all of the teams, so we took, um, you know, probably a quarter of their tournament at the Columbia Playfields, and so it's those kinds of regional tournaments where we can partner with others, you know, through your office and through the Visitor and Convention mm -hmm. Bureau, <coughs> that kind of help make the difference on some of these shoulder seasons too in the spring and the fall. And you work well with the other recreation departments, so if there needs to be some give and take, you guys are able to do that. Absolutely. It's, um, it's a bit of a friendly competition. Of course. It's, um, you know, of course, we all want these activities to happen in our communities, mm -hmm. but what's good for one community is also good for another. So you mentioned lodging tax, which I'm part of, so I've seen a lot of the applications over the years that have come through, and lodging tax, the committee is very favorable because of what you guys bring in for tourism, which you know is tourism tourists are amazing because they come in and they spend their dollars and then they leave. So the additional wear and tear on our infrastructure is less by a tourist, but our citizens actually benefit greater by tourists coming into our community. So um, in the past, it's really been sports fields, the really big bang type of activities that you've come to lodging tax for. This year, you switched it up a little bit and started bringing in um a request for John Dam Plaza. Do you want to talk about your uh, your plans for the master plan of John Dam? I'm really excited about John okay. Dam Plaza. Yeah. Sweet. So John Dam Plaza is sort of like the city's town square. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's the place where traditionally people have gathered for political rallies, um, for special events, for concerts. It's just a place where people go to kind of be seen. It's surrounded um, by by two principal arterials in the city, so it has a lot of visibility. Mm -hmm. Right next to the police station, right next to our downtown shopping area, the federal building, et cetera. So really prime location. Um, so, so we've just finished a master planning effort um, for John Dam Plaza to try and capitalize on, I guess, how it's traditionally been used, right? So um, we want to see additional gatherings there, is what it amounts to. The citizens expect to see additional gatherings there. So let's just say Live at Five concert series. Mm -hmm. It's been a wildly popular concert series in the summer. Um, it's on Thursday nights for several weeks throughout the year, and um, thousands of people attend. Right. It's super popular. Um, but it has 
always taken place on a little grassy knoll on the south end of the park, this quaint little <laughs> facility where thousands of people come and gather. And it's, it's worked, sort of, um, but we think it can be better. And so this year, as you mentioned, we came to Lodging Tax to attempt to fund a different project, which is a performance stage. So we're 90% um, through the design phase on a stage. And after the final Live at Five concert series this year, after that final concert, um, we'll begin work on a, a formal stage in John Dan Plaza. So it'll be a big, um, proper stage that can accommodate very large events. It'll have all the right power and the lighting and the size and the scale um, to do local performing art. So mid-Columbia ballet and um, folk singers and the symphony can play there just as easily as amplified sound. We're modeling the facility somewhat after the Moses Lake Amphitheater, which does attract um, pretty large events. Mm -hmm. Several thousand, three thousand people can attend. We're working with local concert promoters to make sure that we have all the right amenities in place um, to accommodate those larger acts as well. Mm -hmm. So um, a promoter can theoretically rent John Dan Plaza, bring in a large act, rent a, a fence and, and, and fence in the park and charge admission for a, um, a fee type of event. Mm -hmm. It can just as easily be um, a free you know, ballet recital as well. Right. So it'll accommodate a large range of, of activities. So that's a, Really exciting project um, that's that's funded and will go out to bid very soon. Now the stage area, is it, um, are you building it all at once or are you building it in phases? So is it a stage area now and then there's extra options that you're gonna build later or is it gonna be all built at the same time? Uh, it'll, it'll depend partially on how the bids come back, mm -hmm. um, but it'll be mostly complete is the plan based on current cost estimates. So we'll have some bid alternates in, in the project that we can select later if money becomes available. But we will have a stage. Um, it will have um, storage and dressing rooms and a bathroom um, as minimum amenities. It'll have a lighting package and a sound package, so it'll, it'll accommodate concerts. Um, the site work around the stage will also be part of the project. So the stage will be built at grade, basically level with the existing dirt or existing grass. Mm -hmm and then we'll dig out the front of the stage four feet deep and then slope it back coming this way so it'll be sloped seating. So the stage itself won't be elevated but the seating will come out and then back up again. So there'll be um, good viewing opportunities from all areas in front. So that what used to be the stage area or what Live at Five will use as the stage area, once that's done, that'll be excavated and, it will. and brought to surface level, right? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. It'll change the look of John Dam. It'll change the look. It'll be a real destination. It'll be a big architectural <laughs> statement right there in the park. I think it's the kind of facility that I th the community will be proud of. And it's a long-term plan. When you guys put in amenities, it's part of a master plan. You don't do anything without a master plan anymore, correct? Absolutely not. I mean, we want to make sure that we, um, we're smart about the investments that we make and that they're investments that, um, that the community embraces and have, have asked for. So I would, um, before we trail off today, I wanna make sure that we pay tribute to the Parks and Rec Commission that you guys work closely with because they're part of the, the master planning process, correct? And They are, yeah. What a great group. Um, so they're one of the cities the City Council's advisory boards. Mm -hmm. um, the Parks and Recreation Commission makes uh, advice to Council regarding park and recreation types of projects and programs. And um, they are just so, so active and involved in the community and so helpful to what we're trying to do. It's, it's amazing. Um, the group is in lockstep with um, the Council's priorities. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, they just uh, very recently made their 2014 annual report to the council right. um, to great fanfare. And yes. uh, so there's, there's a good partnership right now between the Parks Commission and the council and the staff. And the three of us working together are gonna do great things. It's been um, very heartwarming to watch your commission commissioners 
they're so active in everything that you do. They, whenever you guys have an open house, they're right there. They'll scribe along, right along with staff. They interact with the public when the public comes and you know has questions. It's just, it's very interesting to watch your commission. I feel like people in Richland have such ownership over their parks and your commission follows that all the way through. Yeah, and you know what's neat about the group too is sometimes you have a, a commission or individuals that, um, that like to see parks as open spaces and are, and are beautiful, but also to be protected. Mm. Um, sometimes you have commissioners or groups that um, are all about just using a facility to its maximum potential and just use it, use it, use it. Um, and then sometimes there's not a lot of attention on, on maintenance. This group here understands that those three things together work to make a, a real um, kind of a dynamic system. So proper maintenance, programming of facilities, and making sure you have facilities available for the intended use all work together. And the Parks Commission um, believes in that model. And, you know, so they're, for example, um, involved in touring the Urban Greenbelt Trail, right? as you mentioned. Yes. And, um, and they'll be out there on a Saturday leading a, a walking tour to familiarize citizens that might not know what that trail is. Right. And so they want to see these facilities get used. Um, our parks and facilities are there for the citizens. Um, they're owned by the citizens, so mm -hmm. let's get out there and use them. You've even changed the way that you do your e-activity guide where you're really introducing each one of your commissioners to the public so that they have a better idea of who sits on the commission. It's not this, you know, Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. They're front and center. They're your neighbors. They're sometimes the students. You have two student members, correct? I do, yeah. And so it's been interesting watching the transformation of your commission really get out in front and stand with staff as you guys have been moving forward and making some adjustments over the few years. You know, the facilities, that was huge. You talked about um, having a deferred maintenance program last year because it goes beyond, again, when, you know, the whole traditional park statement that I made earlier on, that's what people think of when they talk about your budget. It's, it's not. You, you have to maintain facilities for the entire city and we're a full service municipality so you've got a lot of facilities that you have to take care of on that that maintenance side that you spoke of as well. We do and I'm glad you mentioned that. We've talked a lot about um, new amenities and um, uh, you know the stage and, and Badger Mountain South and growth opportunities and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I want to make the point that that's absolutely not the focus of, of what we're doing. What the focus of what we've been doing the last couple of years is slowing down a little bit and taking a, a good inventory of the facilities and parks that we have and prioritizing um, some of this deferred maintenance work that <clears throat> had been delayed over the years. Mm -hmm. And so we're very much in a mode right now of taking care of what we have and making sure that previous investments that the community has made in different facilities um, is protected. And so we've, we've slowed it way down a little bit and we're, we're replacing pumps and roofs and we're painting and we're doing um, concrete repair and looking at tripping hazards and we're, we're doing the basics right now. And um, we're also in the middle of preparing a, a life cycle plan so that we know responsibly how much money the city ought to be setting aside each year for each of our facilities. Just like any homeowner would do. You have a rainy day fund if you need to replace um, your air conditioning unit at home. Mm -hmm. Well, the city ought to be doing that as well and we're in the middle of, of that process. While you're also trying to balance maintaining the parks, slowly growing the parks, <laughs> but it's also, that's one of the reasons why you guys really have stuck to this master planning as well, right? So that you know what you're going to be growing into. And with that said, you're still looking at our older parks to make sure that they're up to the standard that needs to be met. We have some really great parks that are unique. Oak Park 
is amazing. If anyone has ever been at Oak Park, they'll understand why. That's so unique. It's almost like the the elephant slide. Yeah. That if you've been there, you know you've been at Oak Park. Oak Park, yeah, that's a neat one. Yeah, so good place to take pictures. It is a great yeah. place to take pictures or videos, right? Yeah. So you need to you need to make sure that you still are able to maintain those older facilities, you know, to current standards while while maintaining everything else. So pretty much anything that touches <laughs> the earth, you guys are responsible that the city owns. Pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. Okay, that's a great segue. <laughs> um, we're, we're near our time. Is there anything else that you'd like people to know about parks or public facilities that you maintain? Um, I do, I'm glad you mentioned um, the parks in the, um, the older part of town. So we're making investments, reinvestments in that part of town. So let's take a look at Barth Park, for example. Yeah, yeah. the tot lot. <clears throat> the tot lot at Barth Park is a really fun and neat place. So we're, um, we're looking at some of our older parks in town and you might call it repurposing some of those. Barth Park is an ex our latest example of that. So we looked at the demographics of Barth Park and um, two years ago we started this process and at the time we had a very successful um, community garden program mm -hmm. and still do and it's a beloved program. And we thought, well, there's really, there's nobody using Barth Park or very few people using Barth Park. So let's see what we can do to, to mix it up a little bit and do something different in Barth Park. So we thought, well, let's do a community garden in Barth Park. And we got hammered. <laughs> the community came out and said, are you crazy? What do you want to do a community garden in Barth Park for? There's going to be you know, X, Y reasons why that's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. We said, OK, that was, that was an idea. And <laughs> not all ideas are good. Yeah, we're not going to ask you that again. Right. Um, but we want we to do something here for you in your neighborhood that will work for you. And apparently community gardens wasn't it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we went back to the drawing board and asked again, well, what is it that you'd like in, in Barth Park? And we looked at the demographics and what we came up with with the neighborhood was a tot lot. And so um, the demographics in, in that part of town are turning now and it, it's become more of a a neighborhood for growing families. There's lots of young kids in, in and around Barth Park again. So we thought, well, let's do a park that's designed for young kids, for tots. And so um, we redid the whole park. It has, and it's a small park, but it has an asphalt path in an oval shape around the perimeter. And we're gonna put a stripe down the middle and a checkerboard on one part. So it's a little like a tricycle racetrack that little tots can race each other on. Yeah. And um, it'll have, a little bit of basketball with lowered hoops, um, and then a little tot playground. And it's, and it's all fenced in. And it's, it's all in this tight little confined space, all with amenities that are designed for tots. And it's, um, it's just what the neighborhood asked for, um, is what they told us that they wanted, and it's perfect for Barth Park. Did something a little different in Gothels Park with the nature playground. And so it's, it's that kind of work with the neighborhood and and putting amenities in place that works with that neighborhood in that right. point in time, that's just, people really seem to like that. And all of this information is available on your guys' website with the master plannings. It is. Yes. 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 And information about the Parks and Recreation Commission is available on the city's website. So everything is linkable off of the city's website onto the parks, um, parksandrec.com. Yes. Right. Um, Thanks, Joe. This has been really informational, and I really hope that everyone's heard that you guys listen to the public and really want to put in amenities that work well for our citizens. So thanks. Thanks this for having me. This has been wonderful. That's great. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.